Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You have poured out your spirit in your church, calling us through your word, inviting us to this ministry and mission which we see fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let us be shaken by the that spirit be moved by your word, that we would know your love for us and in knowing that love for us to share it with the world, that it would hear your word, be drawn to faith, away from the darkness and into the light. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, who is our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, it's Reformation Sunday, right? We've got our red on. I mean, it's like a red out around here, right? I think this was a, 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 a collection of Georgia Bulldog fans, all the red and, and whatnot. But no, we're in North Florida. But, you know, that having been said, I mean, we're, we're ready to go, right? We're excited. It's Reformation Sunday. Those Lutheran distinctives are all over the place, right? So I thought, what, what a better way to start off the, uh, our message this morning to kind of reflect on those ideas that the, the distinctiveness of Lutheranism, right? How about the top ten Yimbalis? You guys know what Yimbalis are, right? It's an acronym. You might be a Lutheran if. You guys have seen these, right? There's, there are really some good ones out there, too. I mean, I did a little research. You might be a Lutheran if you only serve Jello in the proper liturgical colors. Hmm? If you think that Garrison Keillor's stories are all true. How about this one? What if someone says, the, may the force be with you? What is your response? Also with you. There you go. That's how it works. You know, we, we Lutherans are, are known for being pretty frugal, right? We have some wonderful examples about that. You know, my father showed me what it was like to be a Lutheran very early on. You know, he was a purchasing agent and understood the, the, the importance of a dollar. So when he would go to the uh, store to buy toilet paper, he'd buy two ply, right? And break them up into two, two rolls. So we Lutherans, we're pretty frugal, right? So you might be a Lutheran if you freeze the leftover coffee for next week's fellowship. Yeah? Or how about this one? The, the be, I think this is frankly the best one. You might be a Lutheran if... The church catches on fire, and you run inside to save the coffee pot. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, all kidding aside, the reality is that Reformation Day isn't about the Lutheran distinctives. It's about something much more important than that. I used to have a, a cross. It was, it was a cross that was given to me as a, as a graduation gift from seminary. It's kind of an odd looking thing unless you looked at it for a little while. It was, it was a cross, but in the center it had uh, a Luther rose in the middle, kind of carved out. It was this pewter thing, very interesting to look at. I mean, you could tell after a while if you looked at it that, that was, it was shaped in the, in the form of a Luther rose. Right there, smack dab in the middle of the cross. And at first I thought, hey, what a wonderful gift. But then thinking about it. Is that what's central to our faith? This Lutheran distinctive? 
No. And Luther himself would make that point. He said, don't name, was, the idea of being called Lutheran was a pejorative. It was put on the early evangelicals, as they were known at the time, or wanted to be known as anyway. A pejorative term. The idea that the Luther rose, something associated with a movement, would be more central than Christ and his cross. Indeed, Luther would scoff at such an idea. Say it would be absolutely ludicrous. Because Luther himself was a theologian of the cross. And understood it wasn't about some level of triumphalism. But instead, it was about Jesus. And the cross. And his word. We understand that the Spirit blows into the church. I mean, isn't it interesting what it is that, that happens before the day of Pentecost in the church with the, the early disciples and then after Pentecost? The, the, the difference is night and day. It's absolutely amazing. First, these gentlemen who, who, who can claim Jesus to be Messiah one minute and then rebuke him the next. I mean, clearly the... The, 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 the windows weren't exactly clear for them. But then, the same man who can do that, St. Peter, after having received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he can preach to thousands of people and they be converted. The work of the Spirit brings the church into being. And the work of the Spirit brings reform within the church as well. It brings change. You might think that it was Luther who first said the church is always in need of reformation. The idea of it was first stated in Latin, Ecclesia Simper Reformandus. Interestingly enough, it wasn't Luther that made that point the first time. In fact, someone Luther would have been extremely familiar with. All right, pastor likes to give out points, so here's my shot at it. Now, we all understand that Luther himself was a monk, and as well as a, a, a priest and a, and a doctor of the church, a theologian, okay? But what order was Luther a part of when he was a, uh, a friar, if you will, a monk? Anybody know? Was he a friend? A pastor will know. Okay, well, of course you'll know. This is their 53 points. Okay, was he a Franciscan? Did he wear the brown habit? He wasn't a Franciscan. I think farther back than much than Francis. Much farther back. August. That's right. He was Augustinian. Absolutely. He was Augustinian. So who was it that, that first brought this idea that the church is always in need of reformation? St. Augustine. Nearly a th over a thousand years before Luther is even born. The idea that the church is in constant need of reformation. And how does the Spirit blow in His church? How does the Spirit speak to God's people? But through the power of God's Word. Now, I find it interesting that, you know, as Pastor mentioned at the very beginning of our worship, how it is that we have the, the Word. We, we take the Word for granted, right? There are literally hundreds of translations... Last night at the Cricker Trunk, I had one of, the, uh, one of the parents of a child who's being confirmed today at the 11 o'clock service ask me about what type of Bible. She wanted to get her daughter a Bible uh, that, she, that would, she could hold on to. I mean, she wasn't necessarily looking to buy one of those, you know, family heirloom kind of things, right? Something that you would, you know, write down the, the births and deaths and weddings and all kinds of things like that. That's not the kind of Bible she was looking to, to, to purchase for her child. Just one that would help her, aid her in the, in the study of the word. You know, and, and, and I gave her a suggestion or two. She wanted a difference. What was a study Bible versus a regular Bible? We had that conversation. But have you ever stopped and thought about the, in the, the number of Bibles that we have at our, at our disposal? I mean, they're just, it's enormous numbers. You've got this translation and that translation. And, and, and there's a lot of value and a lot of different approaches. And I have to say, one of my wife's uh, contributions to my theological development was 
was uh, introducing me to a Bible I'd never even heard of before called the Amplified Bible. Now, that's used a lot in charismatic and, and Pentecostal uh, uh, re references. It, it, it's really kind of an interesting thing. It, it, the word amplified lets you know it, it takes a word in, from the Greek, and in the English it kind of expands on it in, in parentheses so that you know that that's not necessarily exactly what was there in the Greek, but, but an expand, expansion of the word itself. So there's a lot of different approaches to, to bringing a translation into uh, or a version uh, into life. We have so many possibilities at our disposal. Uh, at something that would, would, would blow Luther's mind. I mean, the average priest of Luther's day would not be familiar with God's word. Even now, as I was attending seminary, uh, we had a, a kind of a, a, an interesting guest with us uh, in our summer Greek program. It was one of the local Catholic priests in the in, their, in that diocese of, of Columbia, of, of South Carolina. He was taking Greek. He'd been ordained for several years, but wanted to learn more about the, the word of God. And so he was taking the Greek there right with us, all the way through to the end. That's, if we want to talk about distinctives, we understand the word to be central to our identity, not as Lutherans to our identity as disciples of Christ. And so in our engagement with the word, that's one of the means through which the spirit calls us, speaks to us. The word is calling and inviting to us. So how is it then that, that when we have so much options, so many options online? I mean, you don't even have to buy a Bible anymore. Did you know that? There's so many versions online, you can get them for free. If you just happen to have the, the right piece of equipment, whether it's a tablet, a, a smartphone, you can put your, the Bible on the smartphone. I mean, that would, I mean how, would, how would that blow the minds of the church of 500 years ago? It is the word that God has given us, calling to us, reminding us of what is central, of God's love, of God's grace, of God's mercy, which is revealed in Christ. So the idea that Christ and, and, and his crucifixion being central to our faith. You know, <clears throat> it was that great first Lutheran, right? You, you knew Apostle Paul was the first Lutheran, right? And it was him that said, when he goes among the Corinthian church and he tells them, I have decided to know nothing else among you except Christ and him crucified. And that calls us not only to reformation, but another reword, repentance. We are called to constant repentance. Why? Exactly for the reason that is spelled out in our gospel text for today. Because indeed, we through the law, through the word of the, of the law that is contained in Holy Scriptures, we are reminded that we are in bondage to sin. And we cannot free ourselves. But we still try. That doesn't mean we're not going to try it, right? Another idea that needs to be molded and shaped with the constant reinforcement of God's free grace. And we know that while that grace is absolutely, positively free, it does not come to us without a tremendous price. The price of Christ's body and blood. And so as his people, we gather around word and sacrament to understand that it is Christ who has brought us to this place and has offered us himself. We are called to follow him. That is part of our reformation, to understand that we are to follow in his footsteps, to follow his lead, is that idea we've been thinking about over the past few weeks of what it means to be Jesus for Jesus to be the Messiah, to suffer, to die, to rise. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been reflecting on Jesus too and this idea of servant leadership. You know, last week, James and John are asking, hey, Jesus, can we sit at your left hand or your right? We want to lead with you in the kingdom of God, right? What does Jesus point them to? 
What does Jesus point all the disciples to? It's that, the idea that comes right before that point. That Jesus has come, and he tells them this three times. I've come to suffer, to die, and rise. That called for a bit, little bit of reformation in their own thinking, I would imagine, to be sure. But Jesus hasn't come to rule this world like an earthly kingdom. But he has come to bring a different kingdom. Where love and mercy and compassion are the rule of the day. So not only do we get in the word, the law, that reminds us that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves, but the good news in that word, the blessing to know that we have been set free, not by our own efforts, weak or strong as they may be, to keep that law, but instead knowing that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And in Christ, as Jeremiah is pointing out in our first lesson today, we have that new covenant. He is our God and we, by nature of our baptism, are his people. What good news that is for us. And so one of the reforms that we constantly reflect on is what does it mean to be the church today, now? What is the Spirit telling us? How do we reach out in the world that doesn't want to know of sin? And if it doesn't need sin, what do we need this gospel thing for? So our gift, our call, is to take the, the word that we have received, this joy, this gift, the word of Jesus Christ, out into the world, Far too often the challenge for the church today is, is it going to look more like the world or is it going to be led by the word, by the spirit, using that word to bring faith? So that's a call for us today. How do we do this ministry that God has entrusted to us? The world is out there. It's hungering. It's starving. And it does not even know. And we have that living bread. Jesus, that has been placed into our ears, our hearts, and comes out our mouths, and by the deeds that we do, because not we are not because we are seeking to, to earn that salvation. No, instead, the works that we do are in direct response to what it is that Jesus has first done for us. We are blessed to have this word. We're not the only ones that have it. We have the gift, though, to share it in all the ways that God has chosen for us to do that. And we do it in some really interesting ways. Last night was a perfect example of that. The pumpkin patch, a perfect example of how it is that we're trying, calling the world, inviting. Listen, folks, God is calling. He is inviting us through a pumpkin patch, a trick or trunk. Strange as it may seem, absolutely. Now, I said this a while back, and I was taking the words from someone else, and I think it remains true. The church, one of the reforms is we can't, we can't be afraid to keep it weird. We can't be afraid to go where the word needs to be proclaimed. So that's our gift. That's our joy. That's our opportunity. So I pray that by this word, by the power of God's word, by the food that we receive here, the joy that is shared among us, we take that out there so that their hearts may be transformed, conformed to Christ, renewed in life, because he's come to give it to us, abundant life, and share that with them. That's our joy. That's our reformation call. Let us go forth out from this place, knowing that a mighty fortress is our God. We have refuge in him. We don't need to worry about the challenges of the world. We get to do what Christ has called us to do, to be his voice in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now let's take a moment to reflect on that very word which is calling us.